Hi folks, welcome to the RCR podcast. So I'm coming to you, for those of you that are watching this on uh, YouTube or watching the video, I'm coming to you from my hotel room in Sutton Coalfield. So first off, a bit of an apology. Uh, what with the Easter holidays and then the bank holiday, it's been a little while since I have put one of these out. So apologies for that. And the reason I'm down in Sutton Coalfield is Quite frankly, it's a, totally, uh, it's a totally personal one. I was down at the motorbike racing with my son, Connor, and uh, Connor works for Rover. Um, he works as an ARB surveyor. He's currently going through the academic side of things at the moment, but he's been out on the road picking up data for, I don't know, about three years now, something like that. So he's quite young. Um, he's 21 this year. And uh, it means that um, everything's kind of black and white, I guess. And he was voicing his concerns to me over the weekend that often the office inquiries are not a good fit with what he finds on site. So I thought I'd explain a little in this short podcast. And uh, yeah, I realised that there was quite a good analogy around this situation. I thought it was kind of apt. So I thought I'd just put together a quick podcast on this one. And... The reason I've got all the podcast gear with me in my hotel room is because I am interviewing the legend that is Chris Penman from Stark Engineering tomorrow, which is kind of cool. Uh, Chris is going to have an awful lot of excellent knowledge to share with the listeners on structural engineering and uh, kind of like uh, why trees should be con uh, considered first, not last in the development process. He's kind of on the same page in terms of the structural engineering calculations. It's uh, it's one of those things that really needs to be considered early on in the process. So anyway, on to today's show. And I should just say, if you ever get any value whatsoever from these podcasts, please do like and share and give us a subscribe because it's the only way this podcast grows. And that's the only way that I can achieve my objectives of helping as many people as possible get their planning back on track with sensible, useful advice. So get the message out there, like and share. So procedures and processes, why the planning authority sometimes gets it wrong. So interestingly, I had a sales call with a, a woman a little bit earlier on this morning. Um, <clears throat> Joanne, was her, Joanne was her name. She's just about to buy um, a piece of land and is doing feasibility study at the moment, which is obviously the correct way to do things. But she'd had pre-app advice. Now, this is something that comes up fairly often, I guess, is that what the officer sometimes comes back with in the pre-app is not necessarily what you're going to get asked for when it comes to submitting your application, getting it validated. And what do I mean by that? Well, essentially, None of the consultees really have a feed into that pre-app process unless it's a particularly big project. Um, I might be wrong on that point, but that's certainly my experience with the applications that we um, we get involved with. And who can blame them? They're all too busy, to be honest. If a tree officer, for instance, or the local author uh, local authority ecologist was to get involved at pre-app stage, then quite frankly, they'd never get any work done. So you kind of can't blame them. So what the planning officer tends to go on for the pre-app advice is local planning policy, good news, and um, any previous applications that have uh, occurred in the area and just that generally tie it back to policy. So in this particular instance with, um, well, it wasn't Joanne actually, it was somebody else. They came to us and they said, look, Matt, we've had a pre-app uh, it was successful, it was broadly supportive, but the officer has said that we need um, biodiversity net gain improvements on the site, and we also need a bat survey. Can you help? I'm like, yeah, we can, we can definitely help. But the thing is, you can't do a biodiversity net gain, clues in the name there, net gain. You can't do that assessment without first having the baseline data. And the challenge there is that um, obviously the client doesn't want to pay for baseline data. They just want the bolt on. They just want the biodiversity net gain assessment, which basically in layman's terms essentially says, look, 
this is the site we've got at the moment and this is how we're going to improve it from a biodiversity and ecological perspective so that could be as simple as installing bird boxes uh, bat boxes uh, bee, bee bricks insect bricks that kind of thing and with fairly simple residential schemes it should be a fairly simple um a fairly simple process but the guidance that's out there at the moment the guidance documents are not really geared towards the residential side of things and in fact actually uh, in terms of biodiversity net gain as a piece of legislation, residential properties are not supposed to be treated with the same enthusiasm as uh, larger projects. But it leaves us as consultants in a bit of a hole because what the client essentially needs is they need their brakes serviced, but they don't want to pay to take the wheels off. Now, I don't know how many of you out there are going to get that analogy, but... Um, it's a it's quite a quite a common thing. So you take your car in for the MOT, the MOT tester fails your car because the brakes aren't up to scratch. You go to the garage and you say, Look, Bob, I just need these brakes done. I need my front front brakes done and then I can get my uh, get my MOT done, get get that box ticked. And uh, Bob says, Well, thing is Matt, we can't get to your brakes without taking the wheels off. Well I don't want to pay. I don't want to pay to take the wheels off. How much are you gonna charge me to take the wheels off? Oh, that'd be whatever, 50 pound an hour, 25 quid to take the wheels off. Well, I'm not prepared to pay that because all I really need is the brakes. It's like, well, I just can't get to the brakes without taking the wheels off. And this cycle goes round and round and it might sound a little bit flippant, a little bit over the top, but that's pretty much the situation that we find ourselves in. We cannot do a biodiversity net gain assessment without that baseline data which means you need a preliminary ecological assessment now i'd caveat that by saying we'll try and save client fees where we possibly can do <clears throat> as long as we can help you navigate that legal minefield so if we've got a surveyor on site doing something else they can pick up some very basic baseline data which will allow us to put together a little robust assessment which gives you some tips and tricks on how to improve biodiversity and ecological value at at the site so Today, in this little short podcast, I'd just have you consider the possibility that when you get comments back from the local authority, quite often, all is not as it seems. They will try and uh, simplify things because they're trying to avoid conflict. Nobody wants to get into conflict as a human being. So things tend to get simplified and things tend to get lost in translation. It's exactly the same with the tree side of things as well. Quite often we'll be asked for an aboricultural method statement and a tree protection plan, but the reality is, first off, we need that baseline data. We can't draw you a simple tree protection plan without that baseline tree data, which means someone coming out to site. So I'd have you consider that if your consultant is suggesting something, they're not just trying to extract fees out of you. There is a process and procedure to go through. Our job is to help you navigate the legal minefield that is the UK planning system which as we know is broken but perhaps that's a subject for another another podcast so that's it from me today folks a little little short eight minute um I'm looking forward to my interview with Chris tomorrow it's going to be fantastic and stick around for that because there's going to be some fantastic tips on there. Remember, if you've ever had any value whatsoever from this podcast, you could do me a massive favour by heading over to wherever you get your podcasts and leaving us a review. Thanks a lot for listening to the show and I will speak to you on the next one. Cheers. Bye.